Jose Powell have left the band to do their own thing. Just who are the new members and how did he find them? Well, Bobby Rondinelli, the drummer, I found in uh, Long Island. And um, I found Bobby in a club called Hammerheads. It's quite a big club. And he was playing with his band and uh, he was playing on somebody else's kit at the time. And uh, I heard him play and he was, he was very good. And uh, it was quite funny because the band every five minutes would say, come on, Bobby, take a solo. And they would stop playing. And this guy would take over. I thought, he's incredible. And uh, with Joey, he, uh, that's a singer, he came from New Jersey. I met him through a friend of mine who was another musician. He said, I, I know a very good singer. Because I wasn't too happy with the way things were going with Graham for the previous six months. And I'd said, well, myself I, I should look around for another singer so uh, off I went to New Jersey and saw Joey playing in this club and I thought he was excellent and he's a little on the short side you know three foot six or something around there <laughs> not really but uh, he's a very nice guy but a great singer in the way that he can he can emote a kind of blues feeling I, I love the blues so I'm Although I'm into classical music and rock, you have to have a blues foundation whenever you're making a kind of a band with a singer. He's a very nice guy. Let me talk to you uh, about the last track of the album, which is called Difficult to Cure, which, if you like, is the title track of the album. Yeah. Uh, it's been bugging me like mad. This relates to something, a piece of music that I've heard before. What is it based on? Beethoven's Ninth, uh, very loosely. We call it Difficult to Cure because it is, to me, in a way, because I find it very hard to get out of my head that classical, the whole syndrome and the classical thing. You're a very exacting taskmaster, and you've also got a reputation of being a hard man, maybe a, uh, not so much hard, but a finite man, a very demanding man of all the people that work around you. Mm -hmm. And I also feel that you're very demanding of yourself. Mm, that's true. I'm not a perfectionist because I'm not that good, but I believe in discipline. You have to discipline a band and get them up early in the morning and um, march them around. And you know, some people don't take to this. They're, they're a little bit um, upset by being woken up that early in the morning. But I firmly believe in getting everybody on the spot and doing the whole thing. But uh, it's, it's working out well. I, I believe in kind of new blood as opposed to the, the old Deep Purple, your, your Led Zeppelins and that, where everybody sticks together. I never really found the right people, so I'm constantly looking. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the public has to suffer as to whether they can associate themselves with certain people and kind of, um, I mean, every year there seems to be a change, but that's the um, responsibility I took on when I left Deep Purple. I did not want a steady band until it's nearly perfect. It'll never be perfect, but hopefully I'll get somewhere near. Can I ask you about Roger Glover? Uh, no. Thank you. <laughs> he says no. Now, I'd really like to talk to you about him because I listened the other night to every Rainbow album in chronological order, and I got the feeling that when Roger came and you and he started working together again, yeah. that there was a great tightening up, a great tightening up of the music and a little bit more commerciality and a little bit more drive. Yeah. Now, was this a result of the way he plays, the way he produces, or the way you felt the music ought to go? Roger is a, a very commercial thinking person. He's a, a painter, really, at heart. But he does see things as a picture, and he has this very commercial popularity. He looks at things in the way that uh, people en masse should hear something. I don't. I'm a very good underground type of guitarist, and I see things as more of a hard-hitting rock and roll. But you need both. You need that hard side, and you need the commercial side. And that's why Roger and I get on so well together, because he's into that type of thing. He always has been. Even with Deep Purple, he was. He was. He added always the commercial touch, the sparkle, the little, as the trogs would say, the bit of little bit of fairy dust that is needed now and again. He would. Uh, I think your attitude toward the guitar is such that a lot of people don't see you as a great guitarist, more as a great showman. 
occasionally in the rehearsals I'll concentrate more on the basic foundation of music but when it comes to the the evening when we play I do project a lot more and uh, possibly a lot of people as soon as anybody sees a guitarist leaping about and breaking his guitar then they obviously think he can't play the guitar if he's breaking it up he's, it doesn't mean anything to him and he's just uh, it's just a novelty but it's not it's the ultimate sacrifice as far as really having a good party and at the end of the evening breaking up the guitar I do believe in both you can do both you can play the guitar very well and you can project and I believe that I can do both although it's um, hard to comprehend because I'd, I'd find that hard to to understand because it it's it, it is difficult but you know I'm so good <laughs> I think it would be accurate to suggest that the British rock press in fact the media in general have been uh, less than kind to you over the past year oh no I wouldn't say that you're a liar <laughs> I think it's it's a case of if you're in the front line then you're gonna expect to be fired at as Margaret Thatcher once said um, yes the press haven't been too nice to us I often read certain things in um, the musical papers back in England and uh, they come out with such incredible things. I have a certain fan club that's going um, with Ian Broad, it's the, it's the official Rainbow fan club. What we do is we have uh, this paper that goes around to all our fans giving them the facts, saying well, this is that and whatever and I'll often write the, the paper and they're doing a lot of favours for us because it's um, it's getting our, the actual facts across to the, pre the, the people. And um, so instead of going through the press and the normal procedure and uh, that they can kind of distort things, we'll just um, give it to them and they put it to us. You were in purple. What's happening to purple? Are purple going to get back together again or what? Um, I don't know. Thank you. Richie Blackmore. <laughs> well, that really developed answer. <laughs> No, um, with Deep Purple, yes, I think uh, we could get back together again, but it would have to be the right people, which was the Deep Purple that were known at the time between 70 and um, 74, which would be Ian Gillen and uh, Roger Glover, John Lord, Ian Pace and myself. Uh, there would not be, I don't know, Glenn Hughes or David Coverdale. It would be obviously Ian. And it's down to Ian. Um, I wouldn't mind doing a quick kind of month tour of um, I know there are a lot of fans that want to hear that Deep Purple type of music mm -hmm. but it has to be the right people and um, I think Ian Gillen is the one that's um, maybe holding everything up in a way he's into his band as we all are, I'm into Rainbow and uh, John Lord and Ian Bates are into White Snake, mm -hmm. but it's down to Ian really because we were going to do something but then Ian backed out and said, um, no, I have to um, go with my band. And uh, I think they would feel kind of let down if I didn't follow them up. So we said, okay, whatever, Ian. You were heard to say on this program that you were the best rock and roll guitarist in the world and that you should be after 24 years of playing. I don't believe that that comment was said in all seriousness. I think there was a a sense of humor, that the Blackmore has a sense of humor, and it was evidenced in that remark. That, that is very true, actually. I heard that um, particular interview back in England in February, and uh, I had said that, but I did follow it up with saying that, of course, there were a lot of guitarists much better than me, but uh, that was edited out very um, to give the, the effect of, obviously, Mr. Blackmore is the bad boy, and he thinks he's the best in the world. No, of course not. You know. But uh, I don't believe for one moment that I'm the best in the world. I'm, I'm just happy to play the guitar. That can't happen here from Difficult to Cure, the latest Rainbow LP. Now, Richie, some time ago we broadcast some anti-Blackmore comments by various people on this program. And being a fair Britisher myself, I thought you might like the chance to, to answer your critics. Have a listen to this. That was me personally getting my dig back at them because they ripped me off. I was still suing them in the high courts, but there was no way I was going to get anything from it. So I had a dig at him in the press, and uh, he's he's pretty annoyed about it. He's made it known that he's going to lay me out when he's when he meets me. It might be the other way around, though. All right, Richie, that's Jimmy Bain, and it's quite a, uh, a severe uh, attack, I think, on you. What would you like to say um, 
in response to that remark. Jimmy is, um, he's a, a good bass player, but he'd only been playing like seven or eight years. He wasn't quite into what we wanted. And um, as much as I didn't really want him to go, we did have to look for a better bass player. We didn't rip him off, as he puts it. I mean, it was just, hopefully, our management has paid him for whatever he did. And I was very sorry to see him leave with Jimmy. You know, he's a very nice guy. He knows that, you know. <laughs> Jimmy's Jimmy, you know. There must have been a discussion in the uh, Rainbow Camp about it, about it going down so well. We got a phone call the day after saying that uh, another band was doing the tour, you know. But I did have a word with Richie Blackman. We were at Manchester last week on the last day of the Rainbow Tour. And uh, he came across to me, shook my hand and said, uh, I'm sorry, there must have been some misunderstanding. And that was Saxon, and that's how they felt when they were taken off the tour. Now, would you like to answer that one? What happened was, I used to speak to a lot of people at the front. I would say, do you have any criticisms? And they said, well, we've, um, we have one criticism, the, the supporting band that you have. We've, we've seen so many times before with Ian Gillan and with other bands, and we feel that we've we paid the full ticket price and we're, we're seeing you, but we're seeing a band that we've seen two weeks ago and whatever that went. So I got onto my management and I said, look, this is not really fair to the public that they're paying all this money for a band they've seen so many times in the last couple of months with every other um, top name band. And that's why they were relieved of their position and we had different bands in. There was certainly um, nothing to do with, um, I think somebody said uh, they were going down too well I always watch the band, and I hope that they go down very well, but um, it wouldn't bother me whether they went down really well or they didn't go down so well, because uh, I know who we are and what we can do. I spent uh, just over two years promoting White Sack. I'd like to knock it on the head now uh, by sort of nipping off and doing anything like that. And I, like, number one, as I say, I'm not interested in working with, you know, for instance, the stage wouldn't be big enough for Blackmore's ego and mine. Never in a million years. Comments by David Coverdale about your good self. How do you react to that? David did say something about the, um, the ego side, that the, the stage wouldn't be big enough for my ego and his. Um, I've never really said anything about David because I think he says it all about himself when he talks. So I think I'll leave it at that. <coughs> Now, the latest Rainbow frontman is Joe Lynn Turner. Joe, you know, you're taking on what I would suggest is a pretty heavy task. I think so, yeah. I think I am. Big task. Challenge, but I love it. Rich had found, uh, was looking for a singer and had found uh, my name and everything, and we got together uh, in a college, I think it was at first, and then through subsequent phone calls and auditions and things like that, uh, we, we did the record. We feel real positive about what we're doing and where we're going to go and uh, how we're going to handle what we already have to handle and what's been in, in our short past and our big future. So uh, I love it and I think it's great. And how do you think the English audience will react to you? I think they'll react favorably. Is there any trepidation in you? Well, I'm, I'm obviously uh, uh, I'm, I'm worried about being accepted. I think everybody is, you know. I mean, it's a big role and things like that. But uh, I do what I do and I try and do it as good as I can. and. Um, I hope they like me. I hope they like us all, you know. Uh, I like them. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, of course, I guess I'm a bit nervous. But uh, I feel confident about the, the rock. I feel the music's good. And if the music's good, then that speaks for itself. I Surrender is a, a very mm. commercial song, right? Uh, a lot of the songs uh, are on the record are more rainbow oriented. Yes. Yes, I think they are. I think more so than the last record. I think that this, this record is less uh, quote-unquote commercial and more um, personality than the last record. Why have you been without a, a sort of a... ...represent... <laughs>